<laughs> Aloha. Mm. Aloha. Good to see you all. Almost the winter solstice. Most people are bundled up. <laughs> take their take your time to see everyone here. Takes a while. Hey, good to see you. Thanks, Kelly, for helping us today. Really helpful. Steve, uh, is it is your setup okay? Is it? It is. Um, Good. I actually don't have another timepiece. You know, my watch battery is in the lost huh, backpack. Right, right. So my, Steve lost his computer and, and many uh, other so things. I only yeah. would have the use of the phone. I don't. I guess if I huh. push the phone. Now, well, I what think, I, I don't Steve, get a time. You, you have to I'll, signal I'll, me. Oh, and I can no, I can ring the bell. I have, I have a better a bell. bell than you. It's true. So I'll start the bell, and then you can finish with the better bell. How's that? All right. Or I can sometimes I'll signal you, and you can see. How's that sound? Either way. Yeah. That's good. Great. No bell. No computer. <laughs> no. No medicine. Hmm. Great. So Michelle, you'll signal me when. Yep, no problem. When, no. When also, I don't giving instructions. Oh, right. Okay, I'll signal you. Yep. I guess I can't call you on the phone. <laughs> that would wake everybody up. Okay, <laughs> I'll signal you. So tell me when to start too. Or, yeah, you can start now, and then I think that I can always come on and I guess say "pow" already for the end of the instructions. How's that? If you don't sure. see me, I'll just say I'll do something, and you'll know. Sound good? I'll say "Buddha." Yeah. How's that, Buddha? Okay, great. Perfect. Buddha. <laughs> Okay. Everybody knows when my, you hear my voice, it's the uh, end of the instructions. Okay. Yeah. 
inviting the body to relax and be comfortable, to just let gravity take over. The, the one skillful resistance is uh, trying to keep the back and, and spine straight. So the systems flow naturally. The breathing, blood flow, neural network, all connected to our spine with all its micro intelligences and letting our letting our spine relax means it it begins to float in fluid which is meant to do and then everything else will follow really the body is mostly water as you know so if we if we really walk and move the most naturally, we're like jellyfish and just swimming through air, waddling our bodies side to side on the subtle level. And then when we pause, the waddling is still happening. It's just really, really slow. And the body is at rest. And the systems are at rest. The neural networks, blood flow, the breathing process. And our awareness notices everything is happening on its own. And the body's stillness grows. And that mirrors the mind and heart. So the mind and heart too become relaxed, calm, tranquil, still. Sometimes awareness itself turns in on itself. Just aware of awareness as much, sometimes more than what we might be aware of in terms of the thoughts, emotions, sensations, visual images, fragrances, sound, vibrations. It's all helpful to know those, but then to abide in just knowing is the most restful of meditative ground. To know whether mindful awareness is at its purest when we notice if there's any agenda or attitude or other accompanying mind state aside from the companions of mindful awareness like the Brahma Viharas Mindfulness streaming along the stream of loving kindness. Our awareness alongside of the streaming of caring compassion. Our empathetic joy where we take the light in the happiness of others. A 
or the stream of upeka, even-mindedness, non-reactiveness, the stream of equanimity. That's the foremost companion of mindful awareness because that's where the purest mindfulness arises out of equanimity. Just the mind that is fully present, engaged, overlooking all arising phenomena, but not attached, not identified, primarily non-reactive. Doesn't mind if what arises is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Let's just see where in your body you might feel an area of buzzing or pressure, vibration. Little energy trails or larger energy streams. And just discomfort or numbness. Yeah, just to notice it. If anything is interrupting the posture you want with a, a rooted base and a straight spine, then to mindfully shift is, is fine. Otherwise the body is, is simply displaying what it is meant to present. And the mindful task of meditation is just notice what's happening. What's arising, how it's behaving. Is it staying or is it streaming? Is it passing away? Is it amplifying? Is it diminishing? Without preference, just to see how our body behaves and how the more awareness arises from within the body, feeling what, what is, not what we want, the more our, our mental stream quiets, calms, becomes tranquil and clear and light. And our vision, our inner vision becomes clear and bright. We might find confidence, confidence, courage to just be as we are and see natural phenomena appear and vanish just as it is. And once in a while, if we come up against difficulty or pain, it's okay to let a thought of compassion arise and without forcing or struggling, just notice if the emotion of compassion comes in to the awareness stream or the emotion of goodwill, friendliness of metta or empathetic joy or the cleanly super emotion of non-reactivity, 
equanimity that neither moves toward or away from anything. It's always relaxed. It has everything it needs. The econ equanimous awareness eventually takes us all the way home. It's just the abiding, <clears throat> abiding in the midst of things as they are, without agenda, without needing them to be different. They're pleasant, unpleasant, they're neutral. We see the dynamic between pain and pleasure, just as it is, that as well is out of our control. The more we're aware of it, the more the mind is settled with that dynamic without choosing one over the other. try and recognize the body intelligence that when we do nothing with full commitment, the body just follows, it knows what to do. It often knows what to do when our mind is seeking things, fixing things, scrambling all over here and there. And how much more at peace our system is when the mind isn't scrambling, isn't seeking, isn't fixing, but just like the body, just letting the conditions of nature take over. And that would be Buddha. Buddha. Sorry.
Do you want to ring your bell, Steve? I had to. Um, Kelly, can you um, can you unmute Steve or? I'm Steve? unmuted. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thanks. Let's have you ring your bell. It's better. <laughs> I think they know the meditation is over. Okay. Nothing like a good bell. Hmm. Burmese bell. Yeah. All we can get of Burma right now. <laughs> All right. I keep wondering. I think I have my headphones on backwards. Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, start with a little bit more from last week on the solstice and um, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, this is a kind of um, meaningful time of the year, but also in the Southern Hemisphere, it's also a solstice, a powerful solstice that we all on the earth share. And I, I was appreciating um, the map behind you, Steve. The maps, Steve usually has maps wherever he goes behind him. And when you said the earth, that um, our bodies are made up of so much water, and so is the earth, right? It's that incredible connection that we all have with this earth. And uh, I mean, primarily water. Yeah. So as we abide or dwell on our planet together, uh, I think that the significance this year is that the new moon, the new moon darkness is is very close to the solstice darkness. So we we get to really go through a very powerful dark time in the next week or two. Uh, and there's a a storm coming where I am that there's already intense thunder thunder happening and the winds are coming and uh, I managed to find some candles before the talk just in case the I think they were they're warning us our power might go out and uh, that 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 way in which modern people we don't always get a sense of of valuing or appreciating the darkness i think if we guard if we garden and we plant seeds in the earth i think that's often the closest we come to to really make making sure that we cover the the seeds so that no light of affects it yet, right? Like, do, do we always think of these things that are the food we eat, so much of it comes from these seeds that get planted in the darkness. And uh, we don't usually light candles in the daylight. We light them at night. And uh, so we don't appreciate, again, that sense of how much the night the power of the darkness, but also the power of the, even the slightest bit of light, how important it is for us, the starlight, the moonlight. Um, so I think that there's there's a meaning at this time of year, I think just, just for us to slow down. Just, even if we just did that, just like slowed down a bit. And, and of course there's so much other, um, power and value to this darkness. So last last week I mentioned how the word for meditation in Pali is bhavana, that, that you're giving birth to wisdom. Uh, and you you the if you think of a womb or a cocoon that even a monarch butterfly comes out of the stage of that's so important is this time of of darkness. 
of development. So how I, I like to relate this to our practice is that when we talk about um, making space for insight in our lives, like taking the time to slow down and making the space for the possibility of insight to arise. Uh, it's really taking the time um, for, for not knowing what's happening. It's, it's taking the time to let go of what we already know in the past. Anything, it's like a total, complete letting go of anything that we know from a past memory. It's a non, non-knowing conceptually. And in that way, even if we do it for a moment, then we can really let a moment take birth, the next moment take birth. We can say this intellectually, right? We can say, oh, each moment is taking birth and passing away, taking birth and passing away. But it's very different to let go of the intellect or any, any kind of reason about it and to just drop into that with our heart, mind, and body, just to totally drop into that and let a moment emerge out of the non-conceptual, which it does. So what I'm talking about isn't anything we're making happen. It just is happening moment by moment. But we stay up in our head with the past and future uh, so that we're protected from really experiencing the being, the beingness of non-conceptual reality, which wisdom takes birth out of. Like a genuine um, insight comes, takes birth out of letting ourselves completely let go of the past and future. And it's like we jump into the non-knowing. And so with, with Steve's beautiful instructions where he was saying um, that if we can see past expectation, right, see past agenda, it's not that you're annihilating agenda or annihilating expectation. It's more that you, you can notice that thought stream come and go, but then you just... Um, don't pick it up. So, so in that way, um, the courage in that in that respect is the courage to not not try to get rid of expectation or agenda. Yeah, you're not trying to demolish past and future. You're much more just being in the timelessness of each moment as it is. I um, read recently that. Uh, I think it's many, <laughs> 400 million years ago, something very, I'm not sure I have that right, but it's like in terms of evolution, when um, the fish and the, the beings came out of the water onto land, that um, the visual field was so different that the, the ability to see far away and, and see distance um, created a whole, different kind of consciousness to about, like it, it allowed for planning and strategy. Isn't that interesting? Just because it wasn't like you were dealing with right, just up right in your face. It's like you could see so far. Uh, and I thought that was a, that's very beautiful. I think that when we practice mindfulness of seeing I think sometimes that's one of the hardest sensors to be mindful of because humans are so um, strong in that sensor of, of seeing and visual. 
And so, of course, that includes that ability to see ahead and strategize and plan. It's not that we're trying to get rid of that or um, deny that strength. It's more that um, just like with every sense door, you're seeing that you don't have to be um, focused on the object, like the object of the seeing or the object of the hearing or the object of the thought, right? Or the, it's like uh, with all of it, the object of the smelling, the tasting, even the emotion, right? It's, it's um, you pull back from what we're seeing. So, so that, that part of this shifting into timelessness is, is actually the commitment to stop making objects out of things. So with hearing, I think it's often easier to explore. The eyes are closed, right? That the visual, the visual sense door is, is less um, predominant. And that we can focus on that practice of just receiving the direct experience rather than going through the thought process, oh, that's a bird, or oh, that right now that's thunder, that's wind, right? That, that's um, the sound of Michelle's voice or whatever, like whatever, or the silence. It's like that, that the words come, you don't try to get rid of the thoughts about the experience, but you keep coming back to, even for seconds between the thoughts about the experience, you keep coming back to seeing if we can receive the direct experience the pressure, the vibration, the texture, and of course, noticing them change until they end. And the seeing, we're receiving the color and the shapes and the movement. And it's a very powerful practice to cultivate that ability to not just see a car or a tree, right? Or a, a curtain, a window, a chair. Of course, those words about the experience, I think visually come in um, so, um, assuredly that it takes that it takes some concerted time to learn how to just wait and let the the colors and the movement and the shapes just come come to the eyes to receive those right at the eye door and so this this the beauty of this practice where you're making making that time for timelessness. You're making the, the time to not just be living in the thought stream that is totally based on memory. It's totally based on the past. In fact, it's not alive. The, the word bird isn't alive. It, it can help us shift the attention to the direct experience that's alive, the timelessness that's alive. So as, as we let that kind of gentle, delicate, uh, very tender uh, birth, right? The birth of a moment. Uh, there's a wordlessness that is exquisite. It, it might not last long, but there, there, that this is that sense of the birth of understanding that, for example, there's no me, there's no bird. There's just the, the pressure or tingling or the pleasantness appearing, living and passing. Being, being connected so deeply with anicca impermanence that everything that takes birth will pass away and the understanding that we never know what's going to happen next. 
often um, we don't use the word sacrifice that much, um, I think, as modern people, but the word, the ability to see that we we sacrifice the need to know what's going to happen next to be present, to abide fully. I think that when you get um, in a modern world, you know, this last night, yesterday, this morning, I've been getting a lot of alerts like flood, flood watch, flood warning, high wind warning, right? Thunderstorm warning, like just all the warnings. And the winds here where I live are coming from the opposite direction they usually are. So this morning, I spent a lot of time trying to make sure there wasn't anything um, dangerous going to happen with what was going to be blowing around. Of course, I can't prevent another tree coming down. Um, but at a certain point, when I finished everything, and um, I'm about eight or 900 feet up, up a hill, um, I looked out and I could see the storm coming. And it was so powerful. It was like I couldn't feel the wind. And there was no sound of the storm yet. But where I live, it's like when you look out at the bay, um, it was so still. But over to the right, I could see the um, white caps and the col different color of the blue. And, and it was moving so slowly. It was just like it took hours. It was very, very slow and gradual. Um, so I can say, oh, there's a storm coming, right? But that really doesn't say anything about the direct experience, yeah? Or how, like, this is happening totally different than any other, any that has happened. Um, and I'm, I'm aware that there's some things that I didn't move yet. <laughs> that I hope I'll have time like to move before they might get hurt. But it's that sense of um, I can hold that I have an intention in the future to do some more. Um, but, but I felt like I took care of things well enough before the sitting. So I included, of course, I included what I heard about a storm coming, or I included about things that need to be done in the future. But in the moment, as we're doing them, it can be timeless. And who knows? It might not even it could stop right now. <laughs> That's what I love about life. It's like you can do all this stuff and like spend the whole day getting ready for something and you it could not happen. So the, the practice is one of not getting rid of anything. And I think that's so vulnerable. Uh, life, this aliveness, this life, not being with, able to control what's happening. Even when we have an intention to practice loving kindness, our metta, and we'll, we'll have such a deep intention for this unconditional, without conditions, that sense of understanding that there'll be pleasant behavior of ourselves and others, and unpleasant behavior, neutral behavior. But we're not focusing on the behavior with metta. We're focusing on that felt sense of a being, the essence of the being beyond the behavior. And so when we have this intention to practice, uh, Sometimes we'll forget that practice metta, that we'll forget that maybe our neediness might come up, right? Or it could be aversion comes up or whatever, right? It's like attachment might come up, greed, lust. It's like whatever comes up, it's like we forget that the practice is a purification, that we're meant to see what isn't 
loving kindness as well. It's like we can have an intention to be mindful, but we might notice that we keep planning, right? And this, we're not trying to get rid of whatever appears as we, we have these intentions to practice. It's much more that we connect and f- face what's happening, right? We don't, we're, we're learning that we don't have to take it personal, that it isn't ours, that if neediness comes up, that it's, ah, oh, I was hoping neediness would come up because I don't have a very good relationship with that. I don't have a good relationship of wise attention or, compa- as Steve was saying, compassion. That remembering, oh, there's a physical unpleasant sensation or there's something in the heart or the mind that's unpleasant. And can we, can we remember that we actually do want a relationship with these things so they don't have this oppressive power over us. There's a kind of um, sensitivity. That comes with the vulnerability of abiding with things just as they are, when there's less need for the protection of aversion, attachment, delusion, there's less need to control how things are. Mm. Some months ago, I came across this quotation from a a solo percussionist. He was born in 1959. His name is Stam Yu Yanashita. He said, ever since my early years, I could hear the moon. And when I watched clouds clouds pass over it, it was like a symphony. That it's so right, so exquisite, so sensitive. So we know that we we hear, we understand that sound is a wave motion, that vibrations are all around us in nature and are, and affects our entire body. And just like with the water, and you can see in the Steve's map behind him, we know that sixty percent of a a male body. Um, is water. 55% of a female human is water. That's a lot of water when you think about it. And how much, how, I mean, there's probably a lot of swishing and (laughs) movement going around that when you're quiet and you wonder, what is this? What is going on? It's like, it's probably just that we're tuning into water element. <laughs> Most of us boil water for something. Maybe it's a cup of tea or coffee in the morning, or maybe it's for some rice or pasta or oatmeal. Yeah, it's like it's such a basic, fundamental part of cooking. But do we, do we take the time to listen to the sound of it? Yeah, the, the sound of it boiling. We might get excited. It's time to take the next step with it. But do we wait? These are all the things that these sensitivities. Um, when we slow down. It's, it's a, we realize we're being given so much moment by moment and that we can receive earth, air, fire, and water. Mm. 
we can receive thought emotion without being oppressed by it. There was a great American naturalist named Henry Best Beston. He spent a long time out in a little, little teeny cottage out on the dunes at the Cape Cod National Seashore before things were developed out on the Cape. And he wrote this about animals. He said they move finished and complete, gifted with the extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. Fellow prisoners, all the beings, insects, right? Birds. All of us animals. I've reflected a lot on this particular um, writing because I, I feel like actually each of us is like a nation. Each human is a nation. The feral cats have taught me a lot about that, that they are so individual. They are so not the personalities are so different from each other. What they need is so different from each other. Every day I learn that just from them. But a plant, um, somebody gave me this little teeny tiny plant and I haven't been that well and didn't plant it for months. And then it looked so up upset and I finally got it in about a month ago. And um, I didn't know what it was and I've never seen this particular plant and it, it flowered a couple of days ago and it's called now i've looked it up it's called cat's whiskers and the flower has these stamens that come out and they look just like cat's whiskers <laughs> it's just it's another whole unfathomable nation right it's like who knew um about this plant and then it's like i looked it up and it's a very um well studied and well um appreciated medicine in Asia, uh, appreciated meaning it's been studied by Western medicine and it's proven that, I mean, you know, it's so rare that these um, plants are proven helpful, right, by Western medicine. But this is one of those plants that is um, well appreciated in the old way and the new way. Uh, And I think this time of year can be um, poignant in many ways that are very different for each one of us. Um, but at the least, it seems like if you're a yogi, uh, it's important to take the time at least just to value light and darkness and and to to value the birth of wisdom out of the non-conceptual awareness and the birth of the brahma viharas out of the non-conceptual awareness
appreciating the preciousness of our human birth, that we have this capacity to bring kindness and know the, the potential for all of us to get fully liberated. May we all be free from suffering. It looks like Gloria has a question, but she disappeared. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you oh, good. Me? Great. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for your talk today. Um, I was um, re I was reviewing some of my um, retreat notes. I'm not sure exactly which retreat it was with you all. And um, I had a question about um, your your suggestion to commit with fierce compassion to a meta practice every day, and um, and then Michelle, you made a comment about how I think it was Upandita had instructed you to cultivate a benefactor. For many years. And I just wasn't sure exactly what that meant when I um, when I was rereading that. And I was wondering if you could clarify that. Did you have a question about the fierce commitment to a meta practice? No, I had a question okay. about cultivating a benefit right. okay. over years. Yeah. As with all the um, meditation techniques, um, the way that a lot of us were taught the metta practice was um, through what was taught in the commentaries. Now, I know, Steve, you could fill that in, but um, in the commentaries, um, it's taught that when you start doing the metta practice, particularly as a um, jhana practice, but that you um, start with what is called the benefactor category. And um, the way Upandita taught me, but I think it's important to know that this is what I like about that quotation about each of us as a nation, because we're all so different. But he, he said to me, um, which has a lot of, for me, humor with it, because uh, when you go through the categories, you, 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 you're meant to start with yourself a little bit and then go to the benefactor and then a dear friend right, you know that friend, neutral, difficult, right? And then you go into the vast, as you know, with the metta chant, you're going into so many. You're making sure that every being in the universe is covered, right? Like you, it's just amazing practice, really, the metta practice um, in that way. And he said to me, um, do yourself 
do yourself um, for five or ten, or you know, at the most fifteen minutes. When, and then when it's really strong, do the benefactor for the rest of the day. So like it, it, it is sitting, or it could be a walking at the beginning, you do yourself a little bit, and then all the rest of the time you're doing this one benefactor. And um, I burst out laughing in the interview when he said it, because I knew that I was the difficult person. I already knew that doing myself for five or ten minutes until it was really strong, and then shifting the benefactor, it was not even going to be possible, because that, I was... I think you all follow that, right? I was the hardest to for myself to do. So um, I switched to the, I, d- I did what he said, but it was <laughs> almost, it would make me laugh, which was fun, like it was buoyant, I, you know, but um, the idea of cultivating a benefactor, which that word is not that modern for us, but it means it, what the meaning is, is that it's some being that's the easiest for you to connect with and to feel this experience of care or tenderness or connection. It's um, it's meant to be the easiest being you can find. It's not always explained that way. It's usually explained as an elder or a child or um, human. But, but at any rate, um, the idea of cultivating it is just like an anchor in Vipassana. So we cultivate the breath, or like we, you know how we teach, the breath hands or sound as something to come back to and to cultivate that as a, a stabilizing force in a lifetime. The benefactor is meant to be the same thing. It's meant to be, uh, no matter what's happening in our life, that we've cultivated this so strongly that we can come back to it and touch into metta. So I hope that makes sense to you that um, now this could be uh, a tree or a stone or the ocean. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be a human. It can be a human. Um, but w- what's so interesting about it is that it's meant to be a being that a not a lot of stuff is coming up with about. So you're not necessarily picking dear f- people or even people you know very well necessarily. Um, because, of course, stuff tends to come up for us around that, those beings. So, Steve, I don't know if you have more to add to this. It's a very good, qu- it's a very good qu- question, Gloria, in terms of um, something to come back to. I, I thought I was failing in the practice with him because I was doing it for a long retreat and he didn't s- say that right away. So like he, I stayed with a benefactor. Um, it was a two month retreat. I think it was six weeks and um, he never gave me another instruction. So I thought I wasn't doing that well in it. But then when he explained that this was something, he didn't ever explain, um, it's like an anchor, but he said, you, you cultivate it for a long, long time. So could you, um, so would you then say that this benefactor is somebody or something like an anchor that you want, um, you want it to be the same person or the same ocean every time or you know like is it, yeah are, are you focusing your heart for that um, being and you're doing that being like every day for a year or yeah does that make sense yeah, and I th- I'm hoping Steve will have something to say about it too, because over the years we've actually changed the style of how we teach. We don't bring the style of categories in as much, um, but it's it's kind of like um, in Vipassana, the practice of anchoring. It might be that I always think it's good to have several anchors that you you'd cultivate. Um, I, you know, you plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. It's always good to have, 
you know, a number of things that you can try um, to help stabilize. So with a benefactor, I think it's always good to have a number of things to try if mm -hmm. um, whatever is the easiest isn't helping, you know, then you try another thing that's easy or another thing that's easier. So it doesn't feel like um, you're only cultivating one benefactor. That's my experience is that it, it's you need more than just that. My experience is that I've needed more than one. Mm -hmm. But that's based on a lot of time now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Steve, do you have anything to add? If the benefactor is the, the strong, strongest object for metta, uh, then of, of course, it's always available, like our breath is for Vipassana, and you can use it as much as you want. The aim, the idea is, is to build up the force of, of kindness. That's the aim. So if, if the consistency of the benefactor is always there, and it's just a natural go-to place for, for the metta to be nurtured in the heart, that, then do it all you want. The aim is that at, at a certain point, the meta energy and the meta intelligence is, is so full, it just does itself. And so it will easily overflow and toward another being or group of beings or all beings everywhere. And if it starts to feel flat, you come back to the revered easy person to, to get it going again. So over time, over days, months, <laughs> years, you just develop a, a, a natural facility. It's like strengthening muscles. And you kind of know where to start or how to start, which person or place, and to kind of kickstart it and get it going. And then, you know, if you, for example, if you use the body, we, we often start around the, the solar plexus, what we call the heart center. And then when it gets really strong, we let it spread out through the rest of the body from that area and then beyond the body. Extended into the environment, the universe. So as Michelle said, the conceptual imagination method is a commentarial method. The Buddha actually taught it without that conceptual imagination. He just taught, call up the Brahma Vihara, Metta Brahma Vihara, or Karuna Brahma Vihara, compassion or Mudita, empathetic joy Brahma Vihara, or Upeka, even-minded, equanimous Brahma Vihara, and abide in it. And in the abiding, again, it's the Brahma Vihara intelligence. In the very abiding, it spreads out. Abiding and spreading out are like the same. So that takes away the sense of doing anything or controlling anything or forcing anything. Just that restful abiding. Thank you. That's really helpful. Really helpful. I, I have um, found in the in the light of what Steve just said that um, you know for example there's this storm outside my house and um, I feel like it's important for me to have a relationship of meta with the storm so I don't necessarily have to have an intention to go to something easy, easier if I can feel metta for the storm, right? But if I have aversion <laughs> to the storm, then it would be as a, a skillful 
means it be a skillful means of my understanding that it would be helpful if I shift to something easier that I have a relationship with that's easy. Do you see? That's what Steve is saying, that you're like building up this force of kindness so that you, you, you're not trying to make kindness happen with someone or some being if it's not, if you can't. You shift back to what's easy. That's the purpose of it, is that you're not, the understanding is that you can't squeeze metta out of aversion. as much as we try <laughs> but we can <laughs> we can shift to what an easier relationship right where we do have that connection and it's easy and then the idea is that at times that the force of that kindness makes the relationship with what's difficult easier because you understand it's not behavior it's essence I'm glad you're trying to do it. It's like a, trying to have a metta practice daily is not that easy. It does take a fierce, a fierce commitment. You know, all my all my pictures have disappeared except for a few. Is that happening to everybody or no? Are you seeing what I'm, are you not seeing what I'm not seeing? <laughs> oh, they're all, everybody, okay. Okay, good. Must be the storm. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Right now. Rose, I can't see, but I can see. I can't see your face, but you can't see me. No, okay. but Steve probably. Oh, there you are, Steve. You can, can see, right? I can see you. Okay, great. There. I'm just using see. my phone. Yeah, I can see you now. Yep. I think you were just saying that, um, like in the Buddha's teaching, he didn't rely on you know using the imagination to conjure spiritual emotions. When I'm, I'm kind of talking about like um something a little different like the reverse when i'm doing when i'm meditating sometimes like i feel like it's like pampancha like conjuring and imagining and then i'll have mudita like i'll be thinking about people and how much <laughs> i like them or how happy i am about a situation and then i'll be like mudita but it's like out of compassion i mean sorry it's out of papancha and then i'll have a little aversion because it came out of that. Does that make any sense? It sounds like a very skillful use of papancha. <laughs> <laughs> Just like anger, if we're mindful of it, it's a skillful tool of awareness to know what anger is, how it feels, how it affects other emotions, how it affects consciousness and our senses, what we see and hear and so forth. In that way, an unskillful state is useful if we learn what it is and to grow calm with it. If we're really mindful of anger, then the mind stays cool and then it can transform into another emotion, into loving kindness even. If we're not mindful, then it's anger that takes control. If we're mindful, mindfulness is stronger than any other mental state. So in the same way, if you're trying to cultivate papancha, I mean, not papancha, if you're trying to cultivate empathetic joy or something, or any of the Brahma Viharas, yeah, to, to go into thought formations, it's not like you're totally pulled in, because by being in papancha, you're, you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, the particular Brahma Vihara will come into focus. You'll feel it in your body.
Yeah, that's right? what it's arising with. It's like co-arising with Papancha or I'm sl come back a little bit into mindfulness and then I'll be like, yeah, there's Mudita based on a story I was conjuring about blah, blah, blah. And then the story recedes. Yeah. That's a good technique. <laughs> okay. Is, I mean, yeah. is that, I know you say it takes longer for these states to kind of arise in Vipassana and we train the mind in these, you know, spiritual motions, like inclining for their re-arising. But what does it usually look like when you're doing Vipassana when it arises? Because now I'm connecting it with like Papancha. And like, if I'm walking out in the world, it's like, oh yeah, beautiful rainbow, ah, mudita. But if I'm sitting here meditating, it's all just like internal stuff, right? So what's the- Quite often, yeah, quite often. And, and you know, and, and it's, it's just trying to, discern the gold within all the dross. Just try to see that, that silver, that brightness, that quality of the Brahma Vihara amidst the mass of, of um, mental phenomena. You're trying to pick out the best of the mental phenomena. And it's like exercising a muscle. Eventually you get it and say, so once you get one of the Brahma Viharas, it can help to find a place in the body, sensations that mirror that, that quality of Brahma Vihara, that joy, that compassion, that, that goodwill, that smooth, equanimous abiding. So yeah, it takes work. We're always working for Papancha. 99% of the time, our thought process is gripped by Papancha. It's a little horrifying to think of, but that's really how it is. <laughs> and so practice is just picking out the gold, the silver, the platinum, the jewels, the gems of the Dhamma. Okay, I like that. That's helpful. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. Everything is, I don't know if you can hear me, but. <laughs> Your mic is down a bit. Yeah, the, the storm is so intense that like everybody keeps freezing, but then it works. So I, you know, if I disappear, <laughs> it, it's the storm. So. Uh, Just yeah, don't open a, your umbrella. Oh, it's really amazing, Sorry. really. So uh, anybody else have any questions? I might not see you, but Steve will or Kelly will. We're getting close to the end of the year. Yep. Actually, um, next Sunday is Christmas, and um, we're not going to do a Sunday sitting, but on the first, we will. So uh, just letting, uh, of course, it will be announced, but letting everybody know that. So the 25th not, but on the first, we will be back. So yes. We're hoping that you have a wonderful um, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, all the different celebrations, or all of them, <laughs> or none of them. We hope every day is a celebration for you. It's a rich, rich time to practice the end of a year. It's perfect Vipassana practice, seeing the ends of things.
I don't think anyone has any more questions. So, actually, yeah, we'll see you in 2023. That's a pretty big deal. Hmm. We hope you all fare well through this, navigate well through this time. Gosh. It's like Hollywood Squares for me. <laughs> Everybody's face keeps coming in and out on my screen. It's really fun. <laughs> I only have six people on my screen. I'm using yeah. my phone. Yeah. I'm using my phone because I, lo I lost my backpack traveling back from the West Coast yesterday. West Coast. Okay, well, I think. May you all be sprinkled with Brahma Vihara Dhamma. Mm, that's nice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for helping. Thank you, Kelly. Yep. Happy holidays. Yes. Thanks, Barbara Fisher. <laughs> and Mona. Mona. Yeah. Thank Mona Slay. Thank you, Michelle. Happy holidays to everyone and be safe. Much love and hugs. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, for being here. For being. <laughs> William, Barbara. Yeah. Andy, <laughs> Amy. Yep, there she is. Well, some of you are coming to the lake next yeah. week. Yeah, that's exciting. Well, I think I'm getting off. My my home is about to blow away, so I gotta. <laughs> Fix it up a little here. <laughs> Take care. I'll we'll see everyone roll. in yeah. two weeks. But I, I can't get on in two weeks. I'll be yeah. in the late. Yeah. Okay. Bye. I'll be. Bye. <laughs> bye.